Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I don't know about you. Uh, my heart needs always prepared as we open God's Word. Um, and um, to use my mother in law's quote, for me to not screw this up. <laughs> so I'm telling on her on that. But let's let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Heavenly Father. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity we have to come and open your word. Father, we thank you that we have already this morning been able to read your word, to sing your word, to pray your word. Lord, now we come to the preaching and teaching of your word. So, Father, for the next little bit, Lord, give us minds that are clear hearts that are not distracted from the lunch plans afterwards or afternoon activities or the upcoming week. Lord, let us be attentive to come and hear from your word and may it stir our hearts. God, would you give us eyes to see and ears to hear the wonderful things from you and about you that you have spoken to us and done for us in Christ, your Son. God, would you work powerfully through us. Help me as the preacher, the teacher of the Word, to get out of the way and to allow your Word to work. Work through me, Father, for your honor and your glory and for the edification of your people as well as for those who may not yet believe do this work. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. I would like to start with a basic illustration of trying to tie in practically to the text. And this morning it comes from C.S. Lewis's well-known book, The Chronicles of Narnia, from the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. As the four children have made their way into the land of Narnia, through the wardrobe in the spare room, or spare room, if you know the book, you got that. The children, though two of them have been there, are lost and clueless. They're clueless what is fully going on in the land of Narnia. All they know is what two of the children have heard. One, that there's a mean white witch who is the queen of Narnia, and the other who thinks the white witch is the rightful queen of Narnia. But as they wander, as they're lost in the midst of snow-covered woods, which this area knows all too well, the four meet Mr. Beaver. Mr. Beaver leads them to his home, provides them a meal, and then begins to tell them Aslan is on the moon. Of course, being unfamiliar with Aslan, they begin a conversation and a dialogue. Let me just read part of that to you. Who is Aslan? asked Susan. Aslan, said Mr. Beaver. Why, don't you know? He's the king. He's the lord of the whole wood. But not often here, you understand. Never in my time or my father's time. But the word has reached us that he has come back. He is in Narnia at this moment. He'll settle the White Queen all right. It is he, not you, that will save Mr. Thomas. She won't turn him into stone too, said Edmund. Lord love you, son of Adam. What a simple thing to say, answered Mr. Beaver with a great laugh. Turn him into stone? If she can stand on her two feet and look him in the face, it'll be the most she can do and more than I expect of her. No, no. He'll put all to right, as it says in an old rhyme in these parts. Rome will be right when Aslan comes in sight. At the sound of his roar, sorrows will be no more. When he bares his teeth, winter meets its death. And when he shakes his mane, we shall have spring again. You'll understand when you see him. But shall we see him, asked Susan? What daughter of Eve, that's why I brought you here. For I am to lead you where you shall meet him, said Mr. Beaver. Is, is 
he a man? asked Lucy. Aslan a man? said Mr. Beaver sternly. Certainly not. I tell you, he is the king of the wood and the son of the great emperor beyond the sea. Don't you know who is the king of beasts? Aslan is a lion, the lion, the great lion. Oh, said Susan, I thought he was a man. Is he quite safe? I shall feel rather nervous about meeting the lion. That you will, dearie, and no mistake, said Miss Beaver. If there's anyone who can appear before Aslan without their knees knocking, they're either braver than most or else just silly. Then he isn't safe, said Lucy. Safe, said Mr. Beaver. Don't you hear what Miss Beaver tells you? Who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe, but he's good. He's the king, I tell you. Just as Aslan is good, but not safe to approach, so is our great and our holy God. He is good, but he is not safe to approach, at least not on our, our own terms and by our own merits. And that's exactly what Exodus 19 teaches us this morning. So if you have a Bible, I'd like to invite you to go ahead and open up to Exodus 19, whether your own copy, or a digital copy, or the few Bible in front of you. While you're turning there, I just would like to give you a running start. Maybe it's been a while since you've read through the book of Exodus. Uh, here, here's kind of what's leading up to this point in Exodus 19. The book of Exodus opens up with leading off just where Genesis did, just some time has passed. We start with recounting that Joseph and his descendants became well known in Egypt. They were loved because Joseph saved the land of Egypt from famine. He was wise to interpret the dreams of the Pharaoh and set aside food to survive. But now 400 years have gone by and, and the new Pharaoh is on the throne. He does not remember Joseph. Nor do the people of Egypt remember Joseph. And now the people of Israel, as they were once welcomed, have been enslaved. They've been enslaved because the Egyptians feared that they were so numerous. If an enemy was to come in, they would join that enemy and overwhelm them. So they put them in bondage. They enslaved them. Then the man, Moses, comes onto the scene, meets with God on the mountain, in a burning bush, the Lord calls Moses to go and confront Pharaoh to call for the people to be let go. Of course, Pharaoh's heart keeps hardening. The ten plagues come about the land of Egypt, attacking these so-called gods of the Egyptians, proving them to be false. The Lord then delivers the people. On the night of the Passover, the tenth and final plague, the firstborn of the all the Egyptians is stricken dead. Pharaoh finally says, get out of here. The people began to wander towards the Red Sea, and then Pharaoh, hardened his, his heart is hardened once more. He begins to chase after the people, chases them right up to the edge of the Red Sea, and then the Lord, he spreads his wings like an eagle and carries Israel through the Red Sea by parting. They cross on dry ground, make it safely to the other side. A, a cloud of smoke is put between the Egyptians and the Israelites. And then the waters come crashing down on the Egyptians. The Lord plummets them. Then the Lord begins to provide for the people as he continues to deliver them. This is what leads up to Exodus 19. And now the people come to Mount Sinai, the most holy mountain where they will receive God's word and his instruction. So hear the word of the Lord from Exodus 19, beginning in verse 1. On the third new moon, after the people of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt, on that day they came into the wilderness of Sinai. They set out from Rephidim and came into the wilderness of Sinai, and they encamped in the wilderness. There Israel encamped before the mountain. While Moses went up to God, the Lord called to him out of the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say 
to the house of Jacob and tell the people of Israel, You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the people of Israel. So Moses came and called the elders of the people and set before them all these words that the Lord had commanded him. All the people answered together and said, All that the Lord has spoken we will do. And Moses reported the words of the people to the Lord. And the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I am coming to you in a thick cloud, that the people may hear when I speak with you, and may also believe you forever. When Moses told the words of the people to the Lord, the Lord said to Moses, Go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow, and let them wash their garments, and be ready for the third day. For on the third day the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai, in the sight of all the people, and you shall set limits for the people all around saying, Take care not to go up into the mountain or touch the edge of it. Whoever touches the mountain shall be put to death. No hand shall touch him, but he shall be stoned or shot. Whether beast or man, he shall not live. When the trumpet sounds a long blast, they shall come up to the mountain. So Moses went down from the mountain to the people and consecrated the people, and they washed their garments. And he said to the people, Be ready for the third day. Do not go near a woman. On the morning of the third day, there were thunders and lightnings, and a thick cloud on the mountain, and a very loud trumpet blast, so that all the people in the camp trembled. Then Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God, and they took their stand at the foot of the mountain. Now Mount Sinai was wrapped in smoke because the Lord had descended on it in fire. The smoke of it went up like the smoke of a kiln, and the whole mountain trembled greatly. And as the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke, and God answered him in thunder. The Lord came down on Mount Sinai to the top of the mountain, and the Lord called Moses to the top of the mountain, and Moses went up. And the Lord said to Moses, Go down and warn the people, lest they break through to the Lord to look, and many of them perish. Also let the priests who come near to the Lord consecrate themselves, lest the Lord break out against them. And Moses said to the Lord, The people cannot come up to Mount Sinai, for you yourself warned us, saying, Set limits around the mountain and consecrate it. And the Lord said to him, Go down and come bring up, bringing Aaron with you. But do not let the priests and the people break through to come up to the Lord, lest he break break out against them. So Moses went down to the people and told them. Now I like to help you as a congregation kind of sum this up ahead of time. I like to give kind of a main idea of, of this text and then if I'm doing this preaching thing rightly the main idea of the sermon is going to match this main idea of the passage and here it is. It's going to be on the screen and if you're going to write anything down I would encourage you to write this. The main idea of Exodus 19 is the Lord in all his holiness extends a covenant invitation to draw near to him. But if we are to draw near and live, it must be on his terms alone. Again, it's on the screen, but let me repeat that. The Lord in all his holiness extends a covenant invitation to draw near to him. But if we are to draw near and live, it must be on his terms Along. Now we're going to unfold this in three parts. Part number one, the covenant invitation. Part one, the covenant invitation, the first six verses. Part two, the covenant life, verses 7 through 15. The covenant life, 7 through 15. And part three, the covenant God, verses 16 through 25. So let's look at part one, the covenant invitation. Look again at verses 1 and 2. On the third new moon, after the people of Israel had gone 
out of the land of Egypt, on that day they came into the wilderness of Sinai. They set out from Rephidim and came into the wilderness of Sinai. And they encamped in the wilderness. There Israel encamped before the mountain. Here it's saying the third new moon, two moons have already completely cycled through. And a new moon is beginning. So roughly 70 days have come and gone since the people left the land of Egypt. 70 days they have been wandering and the Lord providing for them. The Lord has provided water and food to care for the people. He has protected them, been with them, and guided them. For 70 days, the Lord was protecting them. But then, the Lord wants to remind his people of what it is he has done. Verses 3 and 4. While Moses went up to God, the Lord called to him out of the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob and tell the people of Israel, You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Before the Lord dares even call his people to obedience, to keep the covenant, he gives them a gospel reminder. He gives them the reminder that he is the God who has crushed their enemies. He is the God who has delivered them from their bondage and slavery in which once held them. This is the God who has put them on his wings like a mother eagle and protecting her young and delivered them and cared for them. Before he dares call us to obedience, he reminds, I have been the God who has delivered you. I'm not calling you to do something and then be delivered. It's already done. And the same is true in the gospel of Jesus Christ. The same is true that our salvation and our call to obedience is not based on that obedience. Obedience is the overflow of our salvation, of our deliverance by a holy God. Christian, Know that before the covenant invitation ever comes, Christ died on a cross. He was pierced for our transgressions so that we may be covered by his blood and live and find deliverance from that of slavery to death and sin. That's what Christ has already done. Before this invitation ever begins, it starts with this reminder. So Christian. Remember the reminder. Remember that even as we now must turn and address this call of the covenant, what it means for us to obey and to grow in sanctification, we first need to remember it starts with the gospel. Let us remember that. So as the Lord begins to prepare, he stirs the people's hearts towards him. He stirs it in reminding this idea of the fact of how he has already been doing this and, and carrying them on these eagles' wings. And so we see the invitation then in 19, chapter 19, verses 5 and 6. Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the people of Israel. A covenant is a binding agreement between two parties. A covenant of promises. If you're married, you, like myself, have entered into the covenant of marriage. As you enter that covenant, you made a set of promises both husband and wife, to one another. Just recall some of these promises. You promise to love her, comfort her, honor and keep her for better or worse, for richer or poorer in sickness and in health, and forsaking all others. Be faithful only to her for as long as you both shall live. These were the covenants I was asked to make to my wife, and then she made the same to me. 
Many of you have done the same in your own marriage, Father. You made these set of promises that were expected to be kept, not by both or one party, but by both. Husbands, imagine if you were the only ones keeping the marriage covenant in your life, wasn't, or vice versa. And so God invites us into a covenant, but He gives terms. He gives promises, both that we are to take up and that He makes to us. And those covenant promises are this primary for us that we are to indeed hear and obey His voice. And to keep his covenant. Now, you think about this, uh, of the idea of hearing and obeying God's voice. You have young children, or maybe some of you look back at when you had young children. What happens when you say, child, did you hear me? Yes, mom. Yes, dad. A good parent, a wise parent, never takes that as the final word. By the way, they, they always ask, what did I say to make sure they heard and obey? And of course, I don't know. We laugh, we chuck. But here's the reality. This is the very type of hearing we do when God speaks. We say we hear. We say, yes, I'm going to obey your commands, Lord. And yet so often... We let it go in one ear and out the other. We don't hear and obey God in His covenant instructions to us. Christian, consider the fact of what it means to live in covenant with the Lord. It's to hear and obey His voice. That's what He makes to us. The question is, will we hear and obey, and will we follow? Brothers and sisters, as we read our Bibles devotionally, as we sit under the preaching of the Word, are we actually attentively reading and hearing? Are we allowing that Word to do heart work in us, to cut to the very depths of our heart and say, you know what? I'm not hearing. I'm not obeying. Are we willing to slow down and actually here as we read the Bible and not say, all right, I've got to get these four passages read so I can check off all these boxes in my Bible reading plan. Don't mishear me. I'm not, I'm not the grudging reading plans. Just don't approach them wrongly. Don't say the primary thing is to check the box and get through this. The primary thing is to hear from God and allow him to speak through that word. That's what it looks like to hear and obey God's voice. That's what he's calling us to in this covenant. Obedience is more important than sacrifice and anything else that we can think of doing. Christian, you may be tempted to think part of covenant life with God, part of hearing this invitation is I've got to then sacrifice certain things. I've got to do all these things to earn God's favor. What God wants most of us is to hear and to obey. That is what his heart's desire for us is. But now what? What do we do when we hear and obey? Well, that brings us to the second part this morning, the covenant life. The terms have been set. The Lord makes clear to the people of Israel what is this covenant invitation and what it's, is it its terms. Now what's left is will the people accept it and now what are they going to do with it? Verse 7 and 8. So Moses came and called the elders of the people and set before them all these words that the Lord had commanded him. All the people answered together and said, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do. And Moses reported the words of the people to the Lord. The people of Israel say that they hear God's instructions, that they hear his covenant invitation, and that they accept these terms. Now, it's easy if we know our Bibles to think, yeah, right, you didn't accept these terms. You, you end up blowing this whole thing, and they do. But the reality is, 
in this moment, they were likely genuine. They were likely not trying to be facetious. They were likely saying, we do accept these terms. But they didn't remember. They didn't remember the promises. They didn't remember the covenant. Therefore, that's why they began to struggle. The whole time of Israel's history, they were a people who did what was right in their own eyes. The book of Judges sums this up. They were a people over and over again. As, as you read through the book of Kings, he did what his fathers did, that which was evil. Every now and then you'll see a king who did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. But rarely. Over and over again, the people of Israel are warned. Remember the covenant you made with me. And yet, and yet you forgot. I promise, unless you forget, I think I, I looked over uh, what God's promise is us. God promised to make the people a treasured possession. He promised to make the kingdom a priest, a holy nation for the people of Israel, if they would keep his commands. If Israel would have obeyed all that the Lord instructed, if they would have kept it, they indeed would have been a people set apart, a people blessed beyond imagined by God, because God keeps his covenant. The problem is the people didn't keep theirs. They weren't a people set apart. They weren't a holy people unto the Lord. They were just like the other nations. They wanted to be more like the nations than they did their God who invited them and had already delivered them. They weren't a people being that a kingdom of priests of representing God to the nations, to the peoples. Christian, do you understand our lives are to display God's glory? They're to display God's glory to people looking at us. One of the ways we reach people is by living holy lives. And that's what all of this covenant life is, is aiming to. But first and foremost, we have to understand that we have to accept these terms. Friend, if you're here and you have never heard of this language of uh, entering a covenant invitation life with Christ, I want to speak directly to you for a moment. This is the person who is yet to believe in Jesus. This is a person who has been maybe wrestling with this for some time and just ignore it. Do you see what God is inviting you to? He's inviting you, even you children. He's inviting you who have yet to believe to see this invitation is for you. He's inviting you to see the terms of his covenant. The work's already been done. Jesus Christ has already come and lived and died, been buried, and rose again from the grave to defeat death and sin. What you need to do is repent of your sin, turn from your sin, and believe in Jesus. Believe that he alone is the way, the truth, and the life. Hope in Him. Make Jesus the object of your faith. That's saying, I'm invited if I will just trust in Him. Friend, if this is you, how will you respond today? Don't wait. There may not be too many more days to respond. See the invitation. Hear it. Believe it. Accept it. If you are interested in hearing more about this, come find me. I know I'm a guest. Come find me after the service. Find the person who invited you or the neighbor sitting next to you and ask them more about what it means to accept this invitation and come to Jesus. Hear the invite. But lest the rest of you who have already accepted this invitation think you get off scotch free, no. The invitation, the accepting of the terms is just the start of the covenant life. It only begins there. The covenant life is a life preparing us to meet our holy God. Notice what takes place here in verse 9. 9 through 11. And the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I am coming to you in a thick cloud that the people may hear when I speak with you. And may also believe you forever. 
When Moses told the words of the people to the Lord, the Lord said to Moses, Go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow, and let them wash their garments, and be ready for the third day. For on the third day the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai in the sight of all people, all the people. The Lord calls the people to himself. That he's going to draw near to them. But they need to consecrate themselves. They need to set themselves apart. They need to make themselves holy. Now, Christian, when we believe, we are justified in our sins. We are declared just and righteous before God because of Christ. But we're not yet glorified, which means sin still dwells in us. Therefore, the, the Christian life, even though the life of the people of Israel was to be constantly being sanctified and is made more holy, more like their God. This is the covenant life, being made holy, preparing to draw near when our faith becomes sight before the Lord, staying in the fullness of His presence and His glory. Now, remember, back to the opening intro of of what Mr. Beaver said Aslan about the queen. If, if she could dare stand without her knees knocking and trembling. That's what it is as we come and stand before our God. If we don't approach him without trembling and our knees knocking, something's wrong. We have yet to rightly see him. He is a good God, but he is not saved. He is holy. And we are sinful. And yet, the Lord, through this, is preparing us. Concentrate yourself. Make yourself holy. Grow in the sanctification. Because I'm going to draw you near to me. I'm preparing you for that moment. Just can see how some of this practically unfolds for the people of Israel. Verse 12. And you shall set limits for the people all around, saying, Take care not to go up into the mountain or touch the edge of it. Whoever touches the mountain shall be put to death. Verse 13, No hand shall touch him, that he shall be stoned or shot, whether beast or man, he shall not live. When the trumpet sounds a long blast, they shall come up to the mountain. Only when God calls and sounds the long trumpet blast will the people be called to draw near. Only on his terms, not their own. Christian, do you realize it's this that the Lord is preparing us for in the Christian life? Every trial, every tribulation, every amount of suffering, every relationship, especially those of difficult relationship, but also those most encouraging, is preparing you to meet God. Because it's growing you in sanctification. Yes, some of those trials and sufferings are hard. A little bit I know about this church, many of you are in that season of suffering. And yet, friend, do not let your suffering go by and think, whoa, it's me. Where is my God? Even though it may be hard to see, note, that God is using that suffering, that tribulation, that hard relationship to sanctify you, to make you more like Christ, to lean more into the bosom of our Heavenly Father, to trust Him. I love it when my two little girls rest on me knowing that they are safe, whether it's a bad nightmare or something else, and they can feel that safety. Christian, that's what we can do with our Heavenly Father. We can lean into Him in the midst of these trials and sufferings and know that God is strengthening us, that God is still bearing us on His wings, that He will protect us and provide us and carry us through until the day our faith becomes sight. Even if the end of our suffering and trials is not relief, but parting from this life and entering the life to come where every tear is wiped away and no more suffering. 
This is the Christian life. This is the covenant life. It's preparing us to draw near and meet God. But there's another aspect here in verses 14 and 15 we see of the practicality of this. It says, So Moses went down from the mountain to the people and consecrated the people, and they washed their garments. And he said to the people, Be ready for the third day. Do not go near a woman. Okay, it's, it's the covenant lifetime married men not to go near their covenant wife? No, that's not the application here. Just let it be clear. That is not the application, man. Like, God has given the beauty of a marriage covenant for a man and wife to be one together. As the people of Israel here are being told to not go near, it's showing that even that that is most beautiful and most displays the gospel, as we know from Ephesians 5, marriage is a picture of the gospel. It's a beautiful thing. But even that most beautiful fails in comparison to the relationship with God, to treasuring Him above the things of the flesh, the things of this world. So part of preparing is to, to see our love for God increase and our love of the things of this world decrease. Part of our sanctification of that process is saying, I want God. I want His Word more than I want the riches of this world. I want God in deeper relationship with Him even than that of my own life. I love my life. I'm thankful to God for five years of marriage to my wonderful wife. Then you can't love your wives well though unless you're loving God first. And wives vice versa. Do we cling more to the comforts of this world than we do that of God and his love for us in Christ? Let us be preparing by putting away the things of this world, the things of the flesh, and clinging more tightly to the promises of God and what He has promised us. He has promised to make us His most treasured possession. And He does just that in Christ. That we are more treasured. The God who owns a cattle on a thousand hills, the God who owns everything, makes His people His treasured possession. More precious than anything else. The very God who created it all loves his people who are in covenant with him. Brothers and sisters, that, that is the love that God has for us. Therefore, let us grow and pursue this holiness. Let us pursue a growth in Christ likeness. Let us constantly be striving and working out towards this in our Christian life. Because that's the very point of and maybe you're lost on why. Well, of course, we've already seen sung this morning, only a holy God. And that's where we turn in our third and final point this morning. A holy God, or the covenant God. Look there at verse 16. On the morning of the third day, there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud on the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast, so that all the people in the camp trembled. Verse 17. Then Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God, and they took their stand at the foot of the mountain. As God drew near, the people trembled as the trumpet sounded. They were fearful, most certainly, as a cloud of smoke comes rolling down as God appears in fire. The reason of this covenant invitation, the reason we need to understand the covenant life is because of the covenant in God in all of His holiness. This is a God who is good, but He is not safe to approach on our own. Notice who it is who goes up over and over again. It's one man, Moses. Moses mediates between the people and the most holy. He makes it possible to communicate with God and the people. But even Moses fell. 
Moses failed to enter the promised land. Moses, because of disbelief, failed. Thank God there's a new Moses, a new and better Moses than that of Christ. Christ is the one already seated next to the Father, interceding and pleading on our behalf. Before the throne of God I stand and have a perfect lead because of Christ who is pleading for us. That is what we have. If it weren't for Christ, we could not draw near to the Lord. And yet Christ is mediating. He's pleading our case before the Lord so that we can draw near to Him. Christian, will you see the most holy God we have and yet know the fact He has made a way for us to draw near to Him and not die, but live? He's made it possible through Christ our King, our perfect sacrifice. This is why we pursue holiness. This is why we remember what he has done. Because only then, only then will we actually pursue holiness. Only then will we understand the importance of it in our Christian lives. Brothers and sisters, part of the reason churches are struggling to be a light into the world to, is because we fail to be a kingdom of priests. We fail to cleanse ourselves and to pursue holiness and actually be a burning light to the nations, to the peoples of the world that are watching. Yes, we're going to be imperfect. We're going to still struggle in sin. That's part of it. We're not going to reach that moment without sin until we are glorified when faith becomes light. But we should be increasing in it. And we should be showing that to the world. Because they're watching. But are they seeing us look more like the world? Or more like our holy, heavenly Father in all his glory? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you. We thank you for your mercy and for your grace to us in Christ. But Father, we plead right now, Lord, for your people to pursue holiness, to draw near to you, to be like you, to be your image bearers as we are made a new creation in Christ. Lord, will you help us do that? And Lord, for any that are here this morning who have yet to believe, Lord, awaken them now. We ask and we pray this in Jesus' name.